I called this reading Let's Get Personal because it's all about me. I want to fill you in a little bit about uh, what this is about before I begin reading. My brother and I often talk about what lucky kids we were, lucky to have had loving parents and to have grown up in Douglaston on Long Island's North Shore. So off and on over the years, I've written brief personal essays, what I call snapshots about those years. Today, I'll be reading a few of these mini memoirs about my growing up days in Douglaston, Except for the first one, they are in my chronological order, from elementary school to high school, and lastly, a summer home from college. I thank you in advance for your patience and tolerance. Some of the people here at the forest have been curious about why I insist on including my maiden name in, on my address and in written documents. So this next might help explain why I feel strongly about it. I wrote it in 2017, and it's called Name Game. My maiden name is Carolyn Nall Cohn. When I was a little girl, I'd announce to strangers, my name is Carolyn Cohn, like an ice cream cone. I liked my nicely balanced initials, too. C-N-C. Back then, I promised myself I wouldn't get married because when a girl marries, she has to change her name. We all knew that, and I wanted to keep my cone name forever. If boys can keep their names when they marry, I thought, why can't girls? But, of course, all 1940s little girls' ultimate goal was to get a husband and have babies, not to become an old maid. It never occurred to any of us that girls could keep their own names. It just wasn't done. People had fun with my name. The family-owned drugstore in our tiny village tucked next to the Long Island Railroad Station included a soda fountain. The druggists served as soda jerks as well as filling prescriptions. Everyone knew everyone, and those men knew that a chocolate ice cream cone was my favorite. Here comes chocolate cone, they'd holler and move behind the marble-topped counter when they saw me walk in. I ate that up, of course. A boy in high school nicknamed me Coney, as in Coney Island. And when I moved to North Carolina to attend college, people asked me, cone like a pine cone? Imagine the rush I got when they thought I was a Greensboro cone. I didn't understand why I was so popular all of a sudden until it was explained to me that the Greensboro Cones were founders of cone mills and every major institution in the city named after them. When my new friends realized I was a cone from Long Island, New York, the rush cooled somewhat. But I did marry and change my name as expected. My new initials were pretty good too, CCC. So I adjusted to losing my coneness and became Carolyn Carlson, wife of Cliff, mother of Dale and Linda, and that was good. Years later, divorced and in a new town, Carolyn Carlson was known as executive director of the Arts Council of Fayetteville, Cumberland County, president of the North Carolina Association of Arts Councils, which is now known as Arts NC, and on several statewide boards. So I wanted to keep my professional name when I remarried. After all, my older daughter waited until she was almost 40 to marry and then kept her maiden name. My husband-to-be, a respected lawyer, older than me by almost nine years, was a progressive forward thinker on social issues. By then, his daughter, also a lawyer, had married and she kept her maiden name. But her dad was uncomfortable with me, his new wife, bearing my ex-husband's name, even though people recognized me for my career, not as my ex's ex-wife. My colleagues knew of my 1981 marriage plans and of my struggle with the name issue. An NCAAC tradition at meetings was for representatives seated around a large table to introduce ourselves to new members. 
So when it came to introductions time at the first meeting after my wedding, my old friends waited to see how I would present myself. Will she? Won't she? Carlson? Weaver? I'm Carolyn. Everyone held their breath. Weaver. My buddies cheered, giving me a standing ovation. They knew me still and were happy with the change. People in town also adjusted to my being a weaver. So did I. However, years into this marriage, I decided to embrace my coneness once again. Three names instead of two. I'd always wanted to keep it, and now I'm Carolyn Cone Weaver. It suits me, and my husband doesn't mind. I'll always be Carolyn Nall Cone in my heart of hearts, daughter of Howard and Jenny Ray Nall Cone, the parents who named me and loved me. By embracing my maiden name, I honor my heritage, as well as the promise I made to myself as a little girl. And I didn't even have to become an old maid. I wrote this next one in 2014. It's called Flotsam or Jetsam. My father grabbed lessons as they occurred and taught them to us while we, they were still warm. Today they'd be called teachable moments. Many of those moments occurred as daddy, my brother and I sailed our lightning class sailboat. We named her the Firefly because we were lightning bugs. Crammed together in that tight cockpit, we learned many things. Seventy years later, I can tell you precisely from what direction the wind is blowing just by turning my head till I hear it equally in both ears. Something else our father taught us. Flotsam is what nature puts into the sea. Jetsam is what man throws overboard. That bit of trivia still surfaces from the depths of my brain, especially when it's a clue in a crossword puzzle. But what, I continue to wonder, would my father call something that nature's sea takes and then returns? Our hometown is situated on a small peninsula elbowing into Little Neck Bay on Long Island's North Shore. My favorite growing up place, a place I considered my very own, was the tip end of that peninsula known as the Point. Piled at the base of the Point seawall is a jumble of glacial debris brought down from northern Canada during the recent ice age. Everything from sharp gravel bits to boulders the size of a Ford coupe, truly a geologist trove. The rocky beach can be a depository for a weird collection of tidal debris. On one of my girlhood forays, I found a soggy sheaf of still legible engineer's drawings of the great bridge that would become known as Throg's Neck. Surely that was jetsam, even though the owner lost it to a predatory gust of wind. Another time I came across a drowned dog. It might have been a boxer wedged into the rocks, its legs thrust stiffly in the air. Hard teats and black flies marked the hairless belly's surface, so swollen it looked like it would burst if I poked it with a driftwood stick. Was this flotsam? Just off the point's far tip, a boulder big as a small shed stood by itself on the shingle. Sometime in the past, literal locals named it Big Rock, and etched their initials into its sides. As far as I know, it's still Big Rock, although when I returned for a reunion 50 years later, it was smaller than I remembered. Was that erosion or the perspective of age? I considered the point my very own, but in fact it belonged to everyone in our town. The outer road, Shore Drive of course, marked the point's border. Families took visitors out to watch weekend sailboat races in the bay. Teenage couples necked, necked in darkened cars at night, and girls and boys of all ages climbed among its rocks year-round. As much as I loved playing with my friends at the point and on Big Rock, the best times were when I could ride my bike out there by myself. 
Whiskers, our wire-haired terrier mutt, ran alongside to keep me company. The glacier that deposited Big Rock, excuse me, <clears throat> I have a resident frog who wants to appear occasionally, so he's back. <coughs> Sorry. The glacier that deposited Big Rock eons ago had also gouged convenient toeholds in its sides. So if a girl wore sneakers and didn't mind scraping her fingers, she could lever herself to the top. On bright blue days, when the wave chop was white as sails, and on days gray as the camouflaged ships that ranked across the horizon, I was queen of the bay, holding the salt wind in my teeth. In September 1947 or 48, on my 10th or 11th birthday, my parents gave me the Girl Scout knife I'd been begging for. The clear green plastic that coated the gold GSA emblem reminded me of lime jello. I could easily open the four silvery blades despite fingernails gnawed so short I couldn't pick up a dime. My father carved my initials, CNC, into the plastic. So if I ever lost the knife, surely I'd never lose it. The finder could return it to me. When it wasn't hanging from my dungarees belt loop, I kept the knife in a cedar handkerchief box in my dresser drawer with my other favorite things. It got lots of use that year. While whiskers chased water rats, I used the biggest blade to scrape up snails and seaweed for my tidal pool farms. I used the screwdriver opener to pry clusters of oil black mussels from the rocks and the pointy little blade to open them to see what was inside. I didn't know people could or would eat such slimy stuff, so the seagulls took care of what I left. After a day in the salt, I'd take my knife home, wash it in fresh water, and dry and oil it carefully so it wouldn't rust, just as my father had taught me. But one day it was gone. I was at Big Rock when I realized I didn't feel its familiar weight at my belt loop or its solid thump on my hip. How could that have happened? Hadn't I closed the clip firmly? All I knew was it was gone. I searched for it till the tide came in, scrabbling aside the stones with my feet and hands till I was late for supper. I begged my father to go down to Big Rock and look for it, but he said, once the tide came in, we'd never find it, and besides, it was my responsibility to take care of my things. I'd lost it. If I wanted another one, I'd have to pay for it. Another teachable moment. I didn't want another knife and mourned my loss. Nothing else would do to harvest mussels and create snail farms. But most important, it had been mine. Whiskers and I still went to the point, though, even during winter storms. The wind and salt spray were so cold it took an hour in my mother's warm kitchen and lots of hot chocolate for the goosebumps to settle and the red to leave my face. The next spring, with longer legs and stronger hands, it was easier for me to climb Big Rock. One day, standing on top to survey my beach, I saw something lime jello green in the stones at Big Rock's base, exactly in the place I'd searched so frantically the previous fall. There it was, the gold GSA emblem, and on the other side, CNC. The metal on the ends had rusted red and the blades never opened again, but I kept it anyway in the cedar box in my top dresser drawer. Was my treasure flotsam or jetsam? The sea had taken it from me, but then returned it when I no longer needed it. I hadn't outgrown climbing among the rocks at the point, but I no longer wanted to create snail farms in the tidal pools. And sometime, probably when my parents retired and got rid of years' worth of family accumulations, including my own, my knife was gone again, along with the cedar box and the other treasures it held. Jettisoned, I suppose. Today, I could go on eBay and pay for one of those knives, just as my father had advised, for $22 or $53, depending on its condition but it wouldn't have my initials carved into it, nor would it smell of salt and mussels and the cedar of the handkerchief box. 
It would fit someone else's hand, not mine. And UPS would bring it to me, not the sea. Now we're up to high school. This is called the Milk Truck Express, and I wrote it in 2017. The little town where I grew up was within the New York City limits, but you'd never know it. Douglaston was home to comfortable houses where children played in big grassy yards, shaded by a collection of exotic trees from all over the world. This is true. We rode our bikes everywhere and even roller skated to grammar school in the village about a mile from our house. <coughs> Frog is back. <clears throat> and half a block from the Long Island Railroad Station. In those 1940 summers, the Iceman, the Knife Grinder, and the Good Humor Man, the Chumer Man to us, drove up and down our hilly, shaded streets, ringing their distinctive bells. But the milkman made his silent pre-dawn deliveries directly to the wooden box on our back porch. Got a cough again. <coughs> Sorry about that. Year round, we got up in the mornings to find fresh milk as well as butter and eggs all ready for breakfast. In winter, the creamy milk often froze, pushing the paper caps up and off the glass bottle tops at a jaunty angle. As far as we knew, the New York City school system never canceled classes due to bad weather. Plus, my parents had a rule. The only way we'd get to stay home was if we had a fever. So my friends and I got ourselves to and from school in all seasons. No carpools, no school buses. Douglaston was one train station stop from Bayside, where we went to high school. Weekday mornings, my friends and I walked the mile from our homes to the station, took the train to Bayside, and then walked almost another mile to school. Remember, this is New York City. <laughs> In the afternoons, we took a city bus to our stop at Northern Boulevard and Douglaston Parkway, with another vigorous miles walk ahead of us. On January 11th, 1954, we woke to a snowstorm with more on the way. My friends had convinced their parents to let them stay home from school, so off I went, alone, intro, into the wintry blast. I was 16 years old, a junior in high school. The schools forbade girls wearing slacks and blue jeans, even in winter, so I wore knee socks with my saddle shoes, in addition to my pleated woolen skirt, winter jacket, and mittens, I pulled a knit hat over my ears and wrapped a scarf around my neck, so I looked pretty much like a Yeti girl as I headed out the door. Ordinarily, Bayside High School had 4,000 students, plus who knows how many teachers. But when I got to school that day, after the frigid commute on foot by train and on foot again, there were maybe 30 students and 12 teachers none of us knowing what to do next, with snow still coming down hard. That was when our school finally relented and sent us home. The city had virtually shut down by that early afternoon, yet I was able to catch one of the last buses from school and got off at my regular stop. I still had that more than a mile trek ahead of me, but this time in deepening snow. It was as though I were the only person in that silent white world trudging along under heavy laden trees. Like me and the US Postal Service though, our milkman made his appointed rounds no matter the weather. I'd slogged about a quarter mile toward home when our milk truck pulled up and stopped next to me. This particular afternoon, the milkman hadn't gotten to his pre-dawn rounds, so when he saw me plowing along all by myself, snow caking my coat, scarf, cap, and knee socks, he took pity. Slipping and sliding, I'd been concentrating on putting one foot in front of the other, so I hadn't noticed him. The lanky driver slid the doors open. He wore the regulation milkman's uniform, the neck-to-ankles white jumpsuit, insulated for winter wear, 
the white cap and heavy boots perfect for tramping to icy back porches. Where are you headed, girlie? He yelled into the wind. M -m 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 Manor Road, I mumbled through chattering teeth. Long ways from here, but climb in. We'll get you there, he said, patting the steering wheel as if it were his trusty old horse. I didn't know him. He always got to our house long before I got up in the mornings, but I climbed in gratefully. The truck's cab had no seats. The driver stood, so I hunkered in the door well as close to the heater as I could get, being careful to keep out of his way as he managed the clutch and gas and brake pedals with his feet. He didn't talk once we started up, focusing instead on following the tracks left by the few intrepid travelers who'd ventured out. Glass bottles clinked gently in the back of the truck as we crunched along. The single, long, black wiper blade inched back and forth across the windshield, opening momentary glimpses of the strange world that we crept through. Most of my familiar landmarks were virtually whited out. It seemed to take hours, but my milkman took me on his milk truck express straight to Manor Road without stopping at any of the other houses on his route. He paused at the top of my street. Which house, he asked as he peered through the windshield. 335, I answered. Ah, the cones. And he headed carefully down our hill, making fresh tracks through the snow. Here you are, girly, he, as he opened the door in front of 335. I climbed out, landing in a snowbank, and thanked him as warmly as I could in my semi-frozen state. I think you might have saved my life, I called. Ha, he growled, you might just be right. And he walked with me around to our back porch, carrying the wire basket of milk bottles to deposit our daily delivery, just a little bit late. Having shed my icy clothes in mother's warm kitchen, my frozen hands and red nose served as testimony to my frigid adventure. I told mother in no uncertain terms what I'd been through, and especially about my winter savior, my milkman. Mother had plenty to atone for. It was she, after all, who'd sent me into the blizzard. As it turned out, the storm had dumped the heaviest snowfall in five years on New York City. It took heartfelt apologies on Mother's part, plus lots of her homemade hot chocolate, using our freshly delivered milk, of course, for me and my heart to finally thaw. And now on to college. This is called Sun Days, not Sundays, but Sun Days, and I wrote it in 2014. People shake their heads when they learn I once taught sailing. You? Indeed, my first real job. Really tough duty. I walked 10 minutes to work through our tree-lined neighborhood, wore shorts and boat shoes, and smelled like the baby oil we slathered all over ourselves to get that nice, even tan. Unlike babysitting, I worked regular hours. I got paid more, too, though not much, even in mid-1950s dollars. Our village was situated on a bay off Long Island Sound. On bright, breezy summer days, Generations, toddlers to grandparents and all ages between, gathered at the dock on the rocky beach to play, swim, and sail. My family had a 19-foot lightning-class sailboat, the Firefly, of course. We were lightning bugs, after all. And since we lived just four blocks from the dock, I spent my growing up summer days on or in the water. <coughs> The local sailing club always needed camp counselors, and I had the experience. So for two of my summers off from college, they hired me, along with three friends, to lead the 9 to 12-year-old group. The club provided Blue Jays, 14-footers moored in the bay, for our lessons. Every morning, my friends and I rowed out to the Blue Jays and towed them back to the dock, two counselors towing two Jays per rowboat. A tough pull, even on a calm day, but when the wind kicked up and we had to row through the chop, the rowboat bucked like a coin-operated bronco. 
We conducted our onshore lessons, rules of the road, navigation, knot tying, on the dock. The actual sailing lessons were on the bay. Rough weather was the only thing that kept us ashore. Most of our days were dazzling. Each morning the campers helped rig and raise the mainsails and jibs, white as the clouds above us. Each boat carried three or four campers, plus a counselor. Once under sail, the four boats' bows cut through water spangled blue with reflected sky. Sun sparkled in our wake. We rotated the job of skipper among the girls and boys. Each took a turn at the tiller, tending the sheets, learning the difference between coming about and jibing, how and when to tack. Serious, in-the-moment exercises not to be taken lightly by either campers or counselors. Every day, every minute, we were responsible for these little people's lives. The children also had to learn how to bring the boat to a stop alongside the boat float at the end of the dock, a teeth-gritting feat in the best of circumstances. The day my little group practiced the maneuver for the first time, we were in my family's firefly instead of a jay. I demonstrated how to approach the boat float at a 90-degree angle, push the tiller hard to starboard, and turn the bow into the wind. Done correctly, we'd stop dead in the water with our starboard side lined up against the float. That day, we contended with a brisk northerly breeze, so in order to turn into the wind, we had to sail toward the swimmer's float. Ordinarily, that wouldn't be a problem, but as one of my campers rehearsed the exercise, a little girl, too far away from the swimmer's float, popped up in the water just ahead of us. The firefly was going fast. To miss the child, I had to make a split-second decision. Crash head-on into the boat float, or crash at an angle into the ramp leading from the dock to the swimmer's float. I grabbed the tiller and steered for the narrow gap. Get down, I shouted to the children in the boat, and look out to the swimmers. People on the dock above us gaped as the firefly's forestay crashed into the ramp. We caromed backwards, heeling to starboard. The mast hit the dock. The boom swung over the campers cowering in the cockpit. We all, the child in the water, my campers, were safe. The firefly had minor damage. As for me, my heart had crawled up into my throat during that minute, but I was fine otherwise. Now, not only do I have tales to tell but disbelieving acquaintances, I have lasting souvenirs of those sun days 60 plus years ago. As the dermatologist removes another basal cell carcinoma, seven so far, he asks, have you spent much time in the sun? I taught sailing, I say. It's all about Carolyn. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs>